Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is New York Times bestselling writer Soman Chenani. His new novel is Rise of the School for Good and Evil. Soman, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, Rise of the School for Good and Evil, how would you describe this new novel? Well, School for Good and Evil is a six-book series that um, started coming out in 2013. Um, it's being made into a movie by Netflix, the first book is, uh, that'll come out in September. It's one of Netflix's biggest movies ever made. Um, it's just big and wild and, you know, super intense. Um, and it it tells the story of two female friends who end up kidnapped to this School for Good and Evil and, and the events that ensue. And, you know, while making the movie, there there were these questions about where the school began and the, the two schoolmasters who ran it, these two twins, one good, one evil, um, who were immortal and these kind of teenagers with infinite power. And I decided, you know, there was an opportunity to tell a story about two males um, that had a very different feel from this other school book. And, you know, these two brothers, Rian and Rafal, who are infinitely powerful and immortal as long as neither kills the other, even though they're both on opposite sides. You know, one, one's evil, they both would love to rule the school for themselves. If either kills the other, they lose um, all their powers. And so I just thought that was such a, a compelling through line for a book that was independent of, of the other six books. So usually prequels are kind of boring and, and um, don't really get you very much. But this was its own sort of uh, completely unique story. Sure. Well, I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write the original series? You know, I think I grew up with a lot of Disney movies and realized that ultimately they didn't do the best job of creating a complex view of what good and evil actually are in the world. Instead, they said the good guy always wins. And if the good guy always wins, that means the good guy is allowed to cheat and do things that aren't necessarily good in order to win, you know, (laughs) and, and you look at, you know, the Lion King, for instance, and, and Simba shows no evidence he will be a good king during that movie. He runs away when he's supposed to fight. He's gullible. He's a coward. He gets his dad killed. He sings a song at the beginning of the movie talking about how much he wants to be king in order to boss people around, which, you know, to me sounds a lot like Scar. And so at the end of the movie, they're, they're faced with this dilemma because Simba comes back to claim his, you know, is throne, but he's an inferior character to Scar. Scar's smarter, better, more capable than him in every possible way. And so Disney does cheats to get their ending because they set up an entire movie where Scar will never fight you. It's why he never fought Mufasa. It's why he has hyenas surrounding him all the time. You know, Scar doesn't physically fight anyone. Um, But he somehow ends up in a physical fight with Simba because it's the convenient way to get Simba to beat him. And Scar dies. And so to me, it was this sort of case, and it shows up in Little Mermaid and other stories too, where Disney fakes a happy ending and cheats to get its happy ending, um, all because they tell you the good guy wins. And that's sort of what happens in our politics too, right? We're telling everybody, oh, the good side always wins. But everyone thinks they're on the good side. And as long as you think you're on the good side, then the, the other side has to be destroyed. So what I'm trying to do is, is present a more nuanced view of good and evil and the idea that that we are all a little bit of both. And it just comes down to who does what in any given moment, you know? Sure. And and I'm curious, what was your initial writing journey when you wrote the first book in your School for Good and Evil series? Had you written before? Had you written fiction? Had you written any early novels that didn't get published? Any, no, not any novels, but I had um, worked on screenplays. So I, I was making my living as a screenwriter at the mm-hmm. time when all of that happened. So, uh, I think it was ultimately my attempt to tell a bigger story than a screenplay could hold. Sure. And, and what was, um, what was the transition like for you from writing screenplays, which are, which are very lean, um, and dialogue heavy to writing, uh, prose and a novel? What was that transition like for you? It was tricky because. With prose in a novel, you have to keep the pacing up. You know, in a screenplay, you can sort of, um, the speed of it is sort of built into the format. And I think I wanted it to feel fast. I wanted you to be able to read it, get addicted, and just keep reading and reading and reading. So 
I think that the, the balance of telling a well thought out story, but also having it move it at the right speed was always going to be a challenge of that first book. Um, but I love how quick it is now that I look back at it. And I think that was my screenplay training. I think it was just the perfect storm of, of a style that was um, built out of uh, images and action mm-hmm. uh, from screenwriting combined with, um, you know, uh, a pretty cool setting and story that ultimately won a lot of young readers over. That's great. Well, you mentioned earlier that um, there's going to be a Netflix movie in September uh, based on the the initial series, The School for Good and Evil. How does it feel to actually see uh, your ideas, you know, uh, transformed and in, in on the screen? I mean, it's so surreal because you know where <laughs> you, you like every author has their version in their head, right? So then to see someone else playing and in the world that you've created and doing their own thing is so odd. Um, and it takes a little bit to get used to, but at the same time, there's these magical moments where something might look exactly like you have in your head. And what you realize is that in a way it mimics the journey of reading. Everyone who reads the book, um, is imaginally uh, creating their own version in their head. And what a movie allows is for people to share that version, you know, so everyone can share it with their friends and be like, look, this is that book I was reading. Um, and my hope is that, you know, readers who watch the movie then want to pick up the book so they can have the true and full experience. That's great. Well, given that your background is a screenwriter, did you work on um, any of the screenplay for the movie? Yeah, I did the first three drafts. And then we ended up having about nine different writers in the course <laughs> of, you know, um, seven or eight years of development. So, um, you know, it, it went through a lot of different ups and downs and and studios and you know went all the way around and um you know i was always there kind of talking to each new writer and and things like that you know um but i think ultimately i was i had to make the decision early on after being you know working on the screenplays for more than two years um for the studio it was this thing of okay it's time to it's just time to focus on the books you know what i mean like someone else someone else can do this so well, one of the major themes from the series seems to be encouraging kids to find their own tribe and not to buy into the idea of what a successful kid should be. Was that a message that would have benefited you when you were that age? I think so. I think it, to me, what I wanted was, you know, I think if I could look back and, and have that message of every everyone has to find out what they want to do for themselves and no adult can tell you what you're meant to do and instead what you should figure out is what you're good at um and really focus hone in on that look for what you're good at and i think that would have been the message that really would have resonated with me well well given your your background as a screenwriter i'm curious when you started working on the novels what what was kind of your writing process when you were actually working on the novel? Did you write um, an outline or, or given your, your background in screen, did, did you write kind of a beat sheet before you started writing the first novel? The first book, I, I literally wrote it almost like as a mini novel. Like mm-hmm. I did a 90 page version of it. Right. Um, a very, very, very detailed treatment. Um, and then with subsequent books, no, I just reload it. I think the first book, I just needed to know what I was doing. And then once I built confidence, I was able to just, just, you know, I do it as an act of faith, trust sure. magic to lead me where it needed to go. <laughs> so are you, uh, thinking about, or have ideas for, um, new series beyond the school for good and evil? I mean, I did school for good and evil for 10 years. Um, and I'm still in it because I got, I'm working on the sequel to, to rise. So there'll be a, it'll be a duology with two right. books. Um, and it's still in it, but I think I'll be done with it by the end of this year. And my hope is that'll be a, my 10 year anniversary working on the series. Um, and I would like to go on to a new world, you know? Um, mm-hmm. but it 10, I would also like a world that has the capacity of letting me be in it for 10 years. So I think I have to be a lot more, um, willing to let space and time, uh, elapse and and really create something that i'm sure of 
That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories or novels? I think it all comes down to your voice. Do you have do you have a voice that is worth watching? You know what I mean? Um, I mean reading. So you have to really develop how you tell a tale. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about milking a cow or somebody crossing the street. You know, if you do it in the right way, people will be compelled. And that comes down to can you create a tone that mimics the way you think and uh, talk, you know, because everyone has a specific tone of voice. And so I think that's the important thing is using your language to match your natural tone. And what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? You know, I've been reading the Elena Ferrante books, which I love. Um, I just think they're fantastic. Uh, uh, the, the Neapolitan Quartet. Um, and I'm on the last one. So I think those were really special. I love anything by Anne Rice. Um, let me think what else. I, I tend to read a lot of books about awareness and um, not necessarily spirituality, but uh, just kind of mindfulness and consciousness and how consciousness works and things like that. I'm always interested in things in, in kind of mind exploration. Sure. So I think that's where I've been you know, recently. That's great. Well, where can people find you online or if they're interested in learning more about your, your, uh, series of the school for good and evil and your new novel, where's the best place for them to go? My website is evernever.com. Um, and, uh, you can find more about me usually on Instagram at Soman C and, uh, Twitter, Soman Chainani. And those, those are the two best places to get me. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with New York Times bestselling writer Soman Chainani. His new novel is Rise of the School for Good and Evil. And as we mentioned, there's going to be a Netflix movie in September based on the School for Good and Evil series. His new novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Soman, thanks for doing this interview. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Harper Audio presents The School for Good and Evil by Soman Chainani Performed by Polly Lee Chapter 1 The Princess and the Witch Sophie had waited all her life to be kidnapped. But tonight, all the other children of Gavaldon writhed in their beds. If the schoolmaster took them, they'd never return. Never lead a full life. Never see their family again. Tonight, these children dreamt of a red-eyed thief with the body of a beast, come to rip them from their sheets and stifle their screams. Sophie dreamt of princes instead. She had arrived at a castle ball thrown in her honour, only to find the hall filled with a hundred suitors and no other girls in sight. Here for the first time were boys who deserved her, she thought as she walked the line, hair shiny and thick, muscles taut through shirts, skin smooth and tan, beautiful and attentive like princes should be. But just as she came to one who seemed better than the rest, with brilliant blue eyes and ghostly white hair, the one who felt like happily ever after. A hammer broke through the walls of the room and smashed the princes to shards. Sophie's eyes opened to morning. The hammer was real. The princes were not. Father, if I don't sleep nine hours, my eyes look swollen. Everyone's prattling on that you're to be taken this year her father said, nailing a misshapen bar over her bedroom window, now completely obscured by locks, spikes and screws. They tell me to shear your hair, muddy up your face, as if I believe all this fairy tale hogwash. But no one's getting in here tonight, that's for sure. He pounded a deafening crack as exclamation. 
Sophie rubbed her ears and frowned at her once lovely window, now something you'd see in a witch's den. Locks. Why didn't anyone think of that before? I don't know why they all think it's you, he said, silver hair slicked with sweat. If it's goodness that schoolmaster fellow wants, he'll take Ganilda's daughter. Sophie tensed. Bell. Perfect child that one is, he said. Brings her father home-cooked lunches at the mill. Gives the leftovers to the poor hag in the square. Sophie heard the edge in her father's voice. She had never once cooked a full meal for him, even after her mother died. Naturally, she had good reason. The oil and smoke would clog her pores. But she knew it was a sore point. This didn't mean her father had gone hungry. Instead, she offered him her own favourite foods. Mashed beets, broccoli stew, boiled asparagus, steamed spinach. He hadn't ballooned into a blimp like Belle's father precisely because she hadn't brought him home-cooked lamb fricassees and cheese soufflés at the mill. As for the poor hag in the square, that old crone, despite claiming hunger day after day, was fat. And if Belle had anything to do with it, then she wasn't good at all, but the worst kind of evil. Sophie smiled back at her father. Like you said, it's all hogwash. She swept out of bed and slammed the bathroom door. She studied her face in the mirror. The rude awakening had taken its toll. Her waist-long hair, the colour of spun gold, didn't have its usual sheen. Her jade-green eyes looked faded, her luscious red lips a touch dry. Even the glow of her creamy peach skin had dulled. But still a princess, she thought. Her father couldn't see she was special, but her mother had. You are too beautiful for this world, Sophie, she said with her last breaths. Her mother had gone somewhere better, and now, so would she. Tonight, she would be taken into the woods. Tonight, she would begin a new life. Tonight, she would live out her fairy tale. And now, she needed to look the part. To begin, she rubbed fish eggs into her skin, which smelled of dirty feet but warded off spots. Then, she massaged in pumpkin puree, rinsed with goat's milk, and soaked her face in a mask of melon and turtle egg yolk. As she waited for the mask to dry, Sophie flipped through a storybook and sipped on cucumber juice to keep her skin dewy soft. She skipped to her favourite part of the story, where the wicked hag is rolled down a hill in a nail-spiked barrel until all that remains is her bracelet made of little boy's bones. Gazing at the gruesome bracelet, Sophie felt her thoughts drift to cucumbers. Suppose there were no cucumbers in the woods. Suppose other princesses had depleted the supply. No cucumbers. She'd shrivel. She'd wither. She'd... Dried melon flakes fell to the page. She turned to the mirror and saw her brow creased in worry. First ruined sleep, and now wrinkles? At this rate, she'd be a hag by afternoon. She relaxed her face and banished thoughts of vegetables. As for the rest of Sophie's beauty routine, it could fill a dozen storybooks. Suffice to say, it included goose feathers, pickled potatoes, horse hooves, cream of cashews, and a vial of cow's blood. Two hours of rigorous grooming later, she stepped from the house in a breezy pink dress, sparkling glass heels, and hair in an impeccable braid. She had one last day before the schoolmaster's arrival and planned to use each and every minute to remind him why she, and not Belle or Tabitha or Sabrina or any other imposter, should be kidnapped. Sophie's best friend lived in a cemetery. Given her loathing of things grim, grey and poorly lit, one would expect Sophie to host visits at her cottage or find a new best friend. But instead, she had climbed to the house atop Graves Hill every day this week, careful to maintain a smile on her face since that was the point of a good deed, after all. To get there, 
she had to walk nearly a mile from the bright lakeside cottages with green eaves and sun-drenched turrets towards the gloomy edges of the forest. Sounds of hammering echoed through cottage lanes as she passed fathers boarding up doors, mothers stuffing scarecrows, boys and girls hunched on porches, noses buried in storybooks. This last sight wasn't unusual, for children in Gavelden did little besides read their fairy tales. But today, Sophie noticed, their eyes, wild, frenzied, scouring each page as if their lives depended on it. Four years ago, she had seen the same desperation to avoid the curse, but it wasn't her turn then. The schoolmaster took only those past their twelfth year, those who could no longer disguise as children. Now, her turn had come. As she slogged up Graves Hill, picnic basket in hand, Sophie felt her thighs burn. Had these climbs thickened her legs? All the princesses in storybooks had the same perfect proportions. Thick thighs were as unlikely as a hooked nose or big feet. Feeling anxious, Sophie distracted herself by counting her good deeds from the day before. First, she had fed the lake's geese a blend of lentils and leeks, a natural laxative to offset cheese thrown by oafish children. Then, she had donated homemade lemonwood face wash to the town orphanage, for, as she insisted to the befuddled benefactor, proper skin care is the greatest deed of all. Finally, she had put up a mirror in the church toilet so people could return to the pews looking their best. Was this enough? Did these compete with baking homemade pies and feeding homeless hags? Her thoughts shifted nervously to cucumbers. Perhaps she could sneak a private supply into the woods. She still had plenty of time to pack before nightfall. But weren't cucumbers heavy? Would the school send footmen? Perhaps she should juice them before she... Where are you going? Sophie turned. Radley smiled at her with buck teeth and anemically red hair. He lived nowhere near Graves Hill, but made it a habit to stalk her all hours of the day. To see a friend said Sophie. Why are you friends with a witch? said Radley. She's not a witch. She has no friends and she's queer. That makes her a witch. Sophie refrained from pointing out this made Radley a witch too. Instead, she smiled to remind him she'd already done her good deed by enduring his presence. The schoolmaster will take her for evil school, he said. Then you'll need a new friend. He takes two children, Sophie said, jaw tightening. He'll take Belle for the other one. No one's as good as Belle. Sophie's smile evaporated. But I'll be your new friend, said Radley. I'm full on friends at the moment, Sophie snapped. Radley turned the colour of a raspberry. Oh, right. I just thought... He fled like a kicked dog. Sophie watched his straggly hair recede down the hill. Oh, you've really done it now, she thought. Months of good deeds and forced smiles, and now she'd ruined it for Runty Radley. Why not make his day? Why not simply answer, I'd be honoured to have you as my friend, and give the idiot a moment he'd relive for years? She knew it was the prudent thing to do, since the schoolmaster must be judging her as closely as St. Nicholas the night before Christmas. But she couldn't do it. She was beautiful. Radley was ugly. Only a villain would delude him. Surely the schoolmaster would understand that. Sophie pulled open the rusted cemetery gates and felt weeds scratch at her legs. Across the hilltop, mouldy headstones forked haphazardly from dunes of dead leaves. Squeezing between dark tombs and decaying branches, Sophie kept careful count of the rose. She had never looked at her mother's grave, even at the funeral, and she wouldn't start today. As she passed the sixth row, she glued her eyes to a weeping birch and reminded herself where she'd be a day from now. In the middle of the thickest batch of tombs stood one Graves Hill. The house wasn't boarded up or bolted shut like the cottages by the lake, 
but that didn't make it any more inviting. The steps leading up to the porch glowed mildew green. Dead birches and vines wormed their way around dark wood, and the sharply angled roof, black and thin, loomed like a witch's hat. As she climbed the moaning porch steps, Sophie tried to ignore the smell, a mix of garlic and wet cat, and averted her eyes from the headless birds sprinkled around, no doubt the victims of the latter. She knocked on the door and prepared for a fight. Go away, came the gruff voice. That's no way to speak to your best friend, Sophie cooed. You're not my best friend. Who is then? Sophie asked, wondering if Belle had somehow made her way to Graves Hill. None of your business. Sophie took a deep breath. She didn't want another Radley incident. We had such a good time yesterday, Agatha. I thought we'd do it again. You dyed my hair orange. But we fixed it, didn't we? You always test your creams and potions on me just to see how they work. Isn't that what friends are for? Sophie said. To help each other? I'll never be as pretty as you. Sophie tried to find something nice to say. She took too long and heard shoes stomp away. That doesn't mean we can't be friends, Sophie called. A familiar cat, bald and wrinkled, growled at her across the porch. She whipped back to the door. I brought biscuits. Shoe steps stopped. Real ones or ones you made? Sophie shrank from the slinking cat. Fluffy and buttery, just like you love. The cat hissed. Agatha, let me in. You'll say I smell. You don't smell. Then why'd you say it last time? Because you smelled last time. Agatha, the cat's spitting. Maybe it smells ulterior motives. The cat bared claws. Agatha, open the door. It pounced at her face. Sophie screamed. A hand stabbed between them and swatted the cat down. Sophie looked up. Reaper ran out of birds, said Agatha. Her hideous dome of black hair looked like it was coated in oil. Her hulking black dress, shapeless as a potato sack, couldn't hide freakishly pale skin and jutting bones. Ladybug eyes bulged from her sunken face. I thought we'd go for a walk, Sophie said. Agatha leaned against the door. I'm still trying to figure out why you're friends with me. Because you're sweet and funny, Sophie said. My mother says I'm bitter and grumpy, said Agatha. So one of you is lying. She reached into Sophie's basket and pulled back the napkin to reveal dry, butterless bran biscuits. Agatha gave Sophie a withering stare and retreated into the house. So we can't take a walk, Sophie asked. Agatha started to close the door, but then saw her crestfallen face, as if Sophie had looked forward to their walk as much as she had. A short one. Agatha trudged past her. But if you say anything smug or stuck up or shallow, I'll have Reaper follow you home. Sophie ran after her. But then I can't talk. After four years, the dreaded eleventh night of the eleventh month had arrived. In the late day sun, the square had become a hive of preparation for the schoolmaster's arrival. The men sharpened swords, set traps, and plotted the night's guard, while the women lined up the children and went to work. Handsome ones had their hair lopped off, teeth blackened, and clothes shredded to rags. Homely ones were scrubbed, swathed in bright colours, and fitted with veils. Mothers begged the best-behaved children to curse or kick their sisters. The worst were bribed to pray in the church, while the rest in line were led in choruses of the village anthem, Blessed are the ordinary. Fear swelled into a contagious fog. In a dim alley, the butcher and blacksmith traded storybooks for clues to save their sons. Beneath the crooked clock tower, two sisters listed fairy tale villain names to hunt for patterns. A group of boys chained their bodies together, 
a few girls hid on the school roof, and a masked child jumped from bushes to spook his mother, earning a spanking on the spot. Even the homeless hag got into the act, hopping before a meager fire, croaking, Burn the storybooks! Burn them all! But no one listened, and no books were burned. Agatha gawped at all this in disbelief. How can a whole town believe in fairy tales? Because they're real. Agatha stopped walking. You can't actually believe the legend is true. Of course I do, said Sophie. That a schoolmaster kidnaps two children, takes them to a school where one learns good, one learns evil, and they graduate into fairy tales. Sounds about right. Tell me if you see an oven. Why? I want to put my head in it. And what, pray tell, do they teach at this school exactly? Well, in the school for good, they teach boys and girls like me how to become heroes and princesses, how to rule kingdoms justly, how to find happily ever after, Sophie said. In the school for evil, they teach you how to become wicked witches and humpbacked trolls, how to lay curses and cast evil spells. Evil spells, Agatha cackled. Who came up with this? A four-year-old. Agatha, the proof's in the storybooks. You can see the missing children in the drawings. Jack, Rose, Rapunzel, they all got their own tales. I don't see anything because I don't read dumb storybooks. Then why is there a stack by your bed? Sophie asked. Agatha scowled. Look, who's to say the books are even real? Maybe it's the bookseller's prank. Maybe it's the elder's way to keep children out of the woods. Whatever the explanation, it isn't a schoolmaster, and it isn't evil spells. So who's kidnapping the children? No one. Every four years, two idiots sneak into the woods, hoping to scare their parents, only to get lost or eaten by wolves. And there you have it. The legend continues. That's the stupidest explanation I've ever heard. I don't think I'm the stupid one here, Agatha said. There was something about being called stupid that set Sophie's blood aflame. You're just scared, she said. Right, Agatha laughed. And why would I be scared? Because you know you're coming with me. Agatha stopped laughing. Then her gaze moved past Sophie into the square. The villagers were staring at them like the solution to a mystery. Good in pink, evil in black. The schoolmaster's perfect pair. Frozen still, Agatha watched dozens of scared eyes bore into her. Her first thought was that after tomorrow, she and Sophie could take their walks in peace. Next to her, Sophie watched children memorize her face in case it appeared in their storybooks one day. Her first thought was whether they looked at Belle the same way. Then, through the crowd, she saw her. Head shaved, dress filthy, Belle kneeled in dirt, frantically muddying her own face. Sophie drew a breath, for Belle was just like the others. She wanted a mundane marriage to a man who would grow fat, lazy, and demanding. She wanted monotonous days of cooking, cleaning, sewing. She wanted to shovel dung and milk sheep and slaughter squealing pigs. She wanted to rot in Gavaldon until her skin was liver-spotted and her teeth fell out. The schoolmaster would never take Belle, because Belle wasn't a princess. She was... nothing. Victorious, Sophie beamed back at the pathetic villagers and basked in their stares like shiny mirrors. Let's go, said Agatha. Sophie turned. Agatha's eyes were locked on the mob. Where? away from people. As the sun weakened to a red orb, two girls, one beautiful, one ugly, sat side by side on the shore of a lake. 
Sophie packed cucumbers in a silk pouch, while Agatha flicked lit matches into the water. After the tenth match, Sophie threw her a look. It relaxes me, Agatha said. Sophie tried to make room for the last cucumber. Why would someone like Belle want to stay here? Who would choose this over a fairy tale? And who would choose to leave their family forever? Agatha snorted. Except me, you mean, said Sophie. They fell silent. Do you ever wonder where your father went? Sophie asked. I told you, he left after I was born. But where would he go? We're surrounded by woods. To suddenly di- In the heat of the moment, you're not just keeping it calm, you're keeping it cool too. With an ice cold cold brew. And not just any cold brew, but one that's slow steeped and mixed with brown sugar and molasses flavor. With a cold foam infused with brown sugar coolness and a cinnamon sugar sprinkle on top. That's keeping it calm, cool, and cold brewed. With Dunkin's new brown sugar cream cold brew, America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. Bundling home and car insurance with GEICO is so easy, your neighbors are probably already doing it. But who? They may drop little hints like... Beautiful day out. Even more beautiful since we saved by bundling our home and car insurance with GEICO. Or... Yard work is hard. Much harder than bundling with GEICO, which was easy. Or it may be even subtler, like... Speaking of burgers, we bundled our home and car insurance with GEICO and saved a bunch of money. Bundling is easy with GEICO. Just ask your neighbors. Disappear like that. Sophie spun. Maybe he found a way into the stories. Maybe he found a magic portal. Maybe he's waiting for you on the other side. Or maybe he went back to his wife, pretended I never happened, and died ten years ago in a mill accident. Sophie bit her lip and went back to cucumbers. Your mother's never at home when I visit. She goes into town now, said Agatha. Not enough patience at the house, probably the location. I'm sure that's it, Sophie said, knowing no one would trust Agatha's mother to treat diaper rash, let alone illness. I don't think a graveyard makes people all that comfortable. Graveyards have their benefits, Agatha said. No nosy neighbors, no drop-in salesmen, no fishy friends bearing face masks and diet cookies telling you you're going to evil school in magic fairyland. She flicked a match with relish. Sophie put down her cucumber. So I'm fishy now? Who asked you to show up? I was perfectly fine alone. You always let me in. Because you always seem so lonely, said Agatha. And I feel sorry for you. Sorry for me, Sophie's eyes flashed. You're lucky that someone would come see you when no one else will. You're lucky that someone like me would be your friend. You're lucky that someone like me is such a good person. I knew it, Agatha flared. I'm your good deed, just a pawn in your stupid fantasy. Sophie didn't say anything for a long time. Maybe I became your friend to impress the schoolmaster, she confessed finally. But there's more to it now. Because I found you out, Agatha grumbled. Because I like you. Agatha turned to her. No one understands me here, Sophie said, looking at her hands. But you do. You see who I am. That's why I kept coming back. You're not my good deed anymore, Agatha. Sophie gazed up at her. You're my friend. Agatha's neck flushed red. What's wrong? Sophie frowned. Agatha hunched into her dress. It's just, um, I'm, uh, not used to friends. Sophie smiled and took her hand. Well, now we'll be friends at our new school. Agatha groaned and pulled away. Say I sink to your intelligence level and pretend to believe all this. Why am I going to villain school? 
Why has everyone elected me the mistress of evil? No one says you're evil, Agatha, Sophie sighed. You're just different. Agatha narrowed her eyes. Different how? Well, for starters, you only wear black. Because it doesn't get dirty. You don't ever leave your house. People don't look at me there. For the creator tail competition, your story ended with Snow White eaten by vultures and Cinderella drowning herself in a tub. I thought it was a better ending. You gave me a dead frog for my birthday. To remind you, we all die and end up rotting underground eaten by maggots, so we should enjoy our birthdays while we have them. I found it thoughtful. Agatha, you dressed as a bride for Halloween. Weddings are scary. Sophie gaped at her. Fine. So I'm a little different, Agatha glared. So what? Sophie hesitated. Well, it's just that in fairy tales, different usually turns out, um, evil. You're saying I'm going to turn out a grand witch, said Agatha, hurt. I'm saying, whatever happens, you'll have a choice, Sophie said gently. Both of us will choose how our fairy tale ends. Agatha said nothing for a while. Then she touched Sophie's hand. Why is it you want to leave here so badly? That you'd believe in stories you know aren't true? Sophie met Agatha's big, sincere eyes. For the first time, she let in the tides of doubt. Because I can't live here, Sophie said, voice catching. I can't live an ordinary life. Funny, said Agatha. That's why I like you. Sophie smiled. Because you can't either. Because you make me feel ordinary, Agatha said. And that's the only thing I've ever wanted. The tenor told clock sang darkly in the valley. Six or seven, for they had lost track of time and as the echoes faded into the buzz of the distant square, both Sophie and Agatha made a wish, that one day from now they'd still be in the company of the other, wherever that was. Chapter Two The Art of Kidnapping By the time the sun extinguished, the children were long locked away. Through bedroom shutters, they peeked at torch-armed fathers, sisters, grandmothers lined around the dark forest, daring the schoolmaster to cross their ring of fire. But while shivering children tightened their window screws, Sophie prepared to undo hers. She wanted this kidnapping to be as convenient as possible. Barricaded in her room, she laid out hairpins, tweezers, nail files, and went to work. The first kidnappings happened 200 years before. Some years it was two boys taken, some years two girls, sometimes one of each. The ages were just as fickle, one could be 16, the other 14, or both just turned 12. But if at first the choices seemed random, soon the pattern became clear. One was always beautiful and good, the child every parent wanted as their own. The other was homely and odd, an outcast from birth, an opposing pair plucked from youth and spirited away. Naturally, the villagers blamed bears. No one had ever seen a bear in Gavaldon, but this made them more determined to find one. Four years later, when two more children vanished, the villagers admitted they should have been more specific and declared black bears the culprit. Bears so black, they blended with the night. But when children continued to disappear every four years, the village shifted their attention to burrowing bears, then phantom bears, then bears in disguise, until it became clear 
it wasn't bears at all. But while frantic villagers spawned new theories, the sinkhole theory, the flying cannibal theory, the children of Gavaldon began to notice something suspicious. As they studied the dozens of missing posters tacked up in the square, the faces of these lost boys and girls looked oddly familiar. That's when they opened up their storybooks and found the kidnapped children. Jack, taken a hundred years before, hadn't aged a bit. Here he was, painted with the same moppy hair, pinked dimples and crooked smile that had made him so popular with the girls of Gavaldon. Only now he had a beanstalk in his back garden and a weakness for magic beans. Meanwhile, Angus, the pointy-eared, freckled hooligan who had vanished with Jack that same year, had transformed into a pointy-eared, freckled giant at the top of Jack's beanstalk. The two boys had found their way into a fairy tale. But when the children presented the storybook theory, the adults responded as adults most often do. They patted the children's heads and returned to sinkholes and cannibals. But then the children showed them more familiar faces. Taken fifty years before, sweet Anya now sat on moonlit rocks in a painting as the Little Mermaid, while cruel Estra had become the devious sea witch. Philip, the priest's upright son, had grown into the cunning little tailor, while pompous Gula spooked children as the witch of the wood. Scores of children kidnapped in pairs had found new lives in a storybook world, one as good, one as evil. The books came from Mr. Doville's storybook shop, a musty nook between Battersby's Bakery and the Pickled Pig Pub. The problem, of course, was where old Mr. Doville got his storybooks. Once a year, on a morning he could not predict, he would arrive at his shop to find a box of books waiting inside. Four brand new fairy tales, one copy of each. Mr. Doville would hang a sign on his shop door, closed until further notice. Then he'd huddle in his back room day after day, diligently copying the new tales by hand until he had enough books for every child in Gavaldon. As for the mysterious originals, they'd appear one morning in his shop window a sign that Mr. Doville had finished his exhausting task at last. He'd open his doors to a three-mile line that snaked through the square, down hill slopes, around the lake, jammed with children thirsting for new stories and parents desperate to see if any of the missing had made it into this year's tales. Needless to say, the Council of Elders had plenty of questions for Mr. Doville. When asked who sent the books... Mr. Doville said he hadn't the faintest idea. When asked how long the books had been appearing, Mr. Doville said he couldn't remember a time when the books did not appear. When asked whether he'd ever questioned this magical appearance of books, Mr. Doville replied, Where else would storybooks come from? Then the elders noticed something else about Mr. Doville's storybooks. All the villagers in them looked just like Gavaldon. The same lakeshore cottages and colourful eaves, the same purple and green tulips along thin dirt roads, the same crimson carriages, wood front shops, yellow schoolhouse and leaning clock tower, only drawn as fantasy in a land far, far away. These storybook villages existed for only one purpose, to begin a fairy tale and to end it. Everything between the beginning and end happened in the dark, endless woods that surrounded the town. That's when they noticed that Gavaldon too was surrounded by dark, endless woods. Back when the children first started to disappear, villagers stormed the forest to find them, only to be repelled by storms, floods, cyclones and falling trees. When they finally braved their way through... They found a town hiding beyond the trees and vengefully besieged it, only to discover it was their own. Indeed, no matter where the villagers entered the woods, 
they came out right where they started. The woods, it seemed, had no intention of returning their children. And one day, they found out why. Mr. Doville had finished unpacking that year's storybooks when he noticed a large smudge hiding in the box's fold. He touched his finger to it and discovered the smudge was wet with ink. Looking closer, he saw it was a seal with an elaborate crest of a black swan and a white swan. On the crest were three letters. S. G. E. There was no need for him to guess what these letters meant. It said so in the banner beneath the crest, small black words that told the village where its children had gone. The school for good and evil. The kidnappings continued, but now the thief had a name. They called him the schoolmaster. A few minutes after ten, Sophie pried the last lock off the window and cracked open the shutters. She could see to the forest edge where her father, Stefan, stood with the rest of the perimeter guard. But instead of looking anxious like the others, he was smiling, hand on the widow Honora's shoulder. Sophie grimaced. What her father saw in that woman she had no idea. Once upon a time, her mother had been as flawless as a storybook queen. Honora, meanwhile, had a small head, round body, and looked like a turkey. Her father whispered mischievously into the widow's ear, and Sophie's cheeks burned. If it were Honora's two little sons who might be taken, he'd be serious as death. True, Stefan had locked her in at sundown, given her a kiss, dutifully acted the loving father. But Sophie knew the truth. She had seen it in his face every day of her life. Her father didn't love her, because she wasn't a boy, because she didn't remind him of himself. Now he wanted to marry that beast. Five years after her mother's death, it wouldn't be seen as improper or callous. A simple exchange of vows and he'd have two sons, a new family, a fresh start but he needed his daughter's blessing first for the elders to allow it. The few times he'd tried, Sophie changed the subject or loudly chopped cucumbers or smiled the way she did at Radley. Her father hadn't mentioned Honora again. Let the coward marry her when I'm gone, she thought, glaring at him through the shutters. Only when she was gone would he appreciate her. Only when she was gone would he know no one could replace her. And only when she was gone would he see he had spawned much more than a son. He had born a princess. On her windowsill, Sophie laid out gingerbread hearts for the schoolmaster with delicate care. For the first time in her life, she'd made them with sugar and butter. These were special after all. A message to say she'd come willingly. Sinking into her pillow, she closed her eyes on widows, fathers, and wretched Gavaldon, and with a smile, counted the seconds to midnight. As soon as Sophie's head vanished beneath the window, Agatha shoved the gingerbread hearts in her mouth. Only thing these will invite are rats, she thought, crumbs dribbling on her black clump shoes. She yawned and set on her way as the town clock inched past the quarter hour. Upon leaving Sophie after their walk, Agatha had started home only to have visions of Sophie darting into the woods to find this school for fools and crackpots and ending up gored by a boar. So she returned to Sophie's garden and waited behind a tree, listening as Sophie undid her window, singing a bird-brained song about princes, packed her bags, now singing about wedding bells, put on makeup and her finest dress, everybody loves a princess in pink, and finally, finally, tucked herself into bed. Agatha mashed the last crumbs with her clump and trudged towards the cemetery. Sophie was safe and would wake up tomorrow feeling like a fool. Agatha wouldn't rub it in. Sophie would need her even more now, and she would be there for her, 
Here in this safe, secluded world, the two of them would make their own paradise. As Agatha tramped up the slope, she noticed an arc of darkness in the forest's torch-lipped border. Apparently, the guards responsible for the cemetery had decided what lived inside wasn't worth protecting. For as long as Agatha could remember, she'd had a talent for making people go away. Kids fled from her like a vampire bat. Adults clung to walls as she passed, afraid she might curse them. Even the gravekeepers on the hill bolted at the sight of her. With each new year, the whispers in town grew louder. Witch, villain, evil school. Until she looked for excuses not to go out. First days, then weeks, until she haunted her graveyard house like a ghost. There were plenty of ways to entertain herself at first. She wrote poems, It's a Miserable Life and Heaven is a Cemetery were her best, drew portraits of Reaper that frightened mice more than the real cat did, and even tried her hand at a book of fairy tales, Grimly Ever After, about beautiful children who die horrible deaths. But she had no one to show these things to until the day Sophie knocked. Reaper licked her ankles and she stepped onto her squeaking porch. She heard singing inside. In the forest primeval, a school for good and evil. Agatha rolled her eyes and pushed open the door. Her mother, back turned, sang cheerily as she packed a trunk with black capes, broomsticks and pointy black witch's hats. Two towers like twin heads, one for the pure, one for the wicked. Try to escape, you'll always fail. The only way out is through a fairy tale. Planning an exotic vacation, Agatha said. Last time I checked, there's no way out of Gavaldon unless you grow wings. Callis turned. Do you think three capes is enough? She asked, bug eyes bulging, hair a greasy black helmet. Agatha winced at just how much they looked alike. They're exactly the same, she muttered. Why do you need three? In case you need to lend one to a friend, dear. These are for me. I put two hats in in case one gets squashed, a broomstick in case there's smells and a few vials of dog tongues, lizard legs, and frog toes. Who knows how long theirs have been sitting there? Agatha knew the answer, but asked anyway. Mother, what do I need capes, hats, and frog toes for? For new witch welcoming, of course, Callis trilled. You don't want to get to the school for evil and look like an amateur. Agatha kicked off her clumps. Let's put aside the fact the town doctor believes all this. Why is it so hard to accept I'm happy here? I have everything I need, my bed, my cat, and my friend. Well, you should learn from your friend, dear. At least she wants something from life, Callus said, latching the trunk. Really, Agatha, what could be a greater destiny than a fairy tale witch? I dreamed of going to the school for evil. Instead, the schoolmaster took that idiot Sven, who ended up outwitted by a princess in The Useless Ogre and set on fire. I'm not surprised. That boy could barely lace his own boots. I'm sure if the schoolmaster could have done it over, he'd have taken me. Agatha slid under her covers. Well, Everyone in this town still thinks you're a witch, so you got your wish after all. Callis whipped around. My wish is that you get away from here, she hissed, eyes dark as coal. This place has made you weak and lazy and afraid. At least I made something of myself here. You just waste and rot until Sophie comes to walk you like a dog. Agatha stared at her. Stunned. Callis smiled brightly and resumed packing. But do take care of your friend, dear. The school for good might seem like a festoon of roses, but she's in for a surprise. Now, 
Go to bed. The schoolmaster will be here soon, and it's easier for him if you're asleep. Agatha pulled the sheets over her head. Sophie couldn't sleep. Five minutes to midnight, and no sign of an intruder. She knelt on her bed and peered through the shutters. Around Gavaldon's edge, the thousand-person guard waved torches to light up the forest. Sophie scowled. How could he get past them? That's when she noticed. The hearts on her windowsill were gone. He's already here. Three packed pink bags plopped through the window, followed by two glass-slippered feet. Agatha lurched up in bed, jolted from a nightmare. Callus snored loudly across the room, Reaper at her side. Next to Agatha's bed sat her locked trunk marked Agatha of Gavaldon, 1 Graves Hill Road, in scraggy writing, along with a pouch of honey cakes for the journey. Chomping cake, Agatha gazed through a cracked window. Down the hill, the torches blazed in a tight circle, but here on Graves Hill, there was just one burly guard left, arms as big as Agatha's whole body, legs like chicken drumsticks. He kept himself awake by lifting a broken headstone like a barbell. Agatha bit into the last honey cake and looked out at the dark forest. Shiny blue eyes looked back at her. Agatha choked and dove to her bed. She slowly lifted her head. Nothing there including the guard. Then she found him, unconscious over the broken headstone, torch extinguished. Creeping away from him was a bony, hunchbacked human shadow, no body attached. The shadow floated across the sea of graves without the slightest sign of hurry. It slid under the cemetery gates, and skulked down the hill towards the firelit centre of Gavaldon. Agatha felt horror strangle her heart. He was real, whoever he was. And he doesn't want me. Relief crashed over her, followed by a fresh wave of panic. Sophie. She should wake her mother, she should cry for help, she should... No time. Feigning sleep, Callus heard Agatha's urgent footsteps, then the door close. She hugged Reaper tighter to make sure he didn't wake up. Sophie crouched behind a tree, waiting for the schoolmaster to snatch her. She waited. And waited. Then she noticed something in the ground. Cookie crumbs mashed into a footprint the footprint of a clump so odious, so foul, it could only belong to one person. Sophie's fists curled, her blood boiled. Hands covered her mouth, and a foot booted her through her window. Sophie crashed headfirst onto her bed and whirled around to see Agatha. You pathetic, interfering worm! she screamed before glimpsing the fear in her friend's face. You saw him, Sophie gasped. Agatha put one hand over Sophie's mouth and pinned her to the mattress with the other. As Sophie writhed in protest, Agatha peeped through the window. The crooked shadow drifted into the Gavaldon Square, past the oblivious armed guard, and headed directly for Sophie's house. Agatha swallowed a scream. Sophie wrenched free and grabbed her shoulders. Is he handsome? Like a prince? Or a proper schoolmaster with spectacles and waistcoat and... Thump! Sophie and Agatha slowly turned to the door. Thump! Thump! Sophie wrinkled her nose. He could just knock, couldn't he? Locks cracked. Hinges rattled. Agatha shrank against the wall while Sophie folded her hands and fluffed her dress as if expecting a royal visit. Best give him what he wants without fuss. As the door caved, 
Agatha leapt off the bed and threw herself against it. Sophie rolled her eyes. Oh, sit down for goodness sake. Agatha pulled at the knob with all her might, lost her grip. The door slammed open with a deafening crack, hurling her across the room. It was Sophie's father, white as a sheet. I saw something, he panted, waving his torch. Then Agatha caught the crooked shadow on the wall, stepping into his broad silhouette. There, she cried. Stefan swiveled, but the shadow blew out his torch. Agatha grabbed a match from her pocket and lit it. Stefan lay on the ground, unconscious. Sophie was gone. Screams outside. Through the window, Agatha watched shouting villagers chase after Sophie as the shadow dragged her towards the woods. And while more and more villagers howled and chased, Sophie smiled, ear to ear. Agatha lunged through the window and ran after her, but just as the villagers reached Sophie, their torches magically exploded and trapped them in rings of fire. Agatha dodged the gauntlet of fire traps and dashed to save her friend before the shadow pulled her into the forest. Sophie felt her body leave soft grass and rake against stony dirt. She frowned at the thought of showing up to school in a soiled dress. I really thought there'd be footmen, she said to the shadow, or a pumpkin carriage at least. Agatha ran ferociously, but Sophie had almost disappeared into the trees. All around, flames spewed higher and higher, poised to devour the entire village. Seeing the fires leap, Sophie felt relief knowing no one could rescue her now. But where is the second child? Where is the one for evil? She'd been wrong about Agatha all along. As she felt herself pulled into trees, Sophie looked back at the towering blaze and kissed goodbye to the curse of ordinary life. Farewell, Gavaldon. Farewell, low ambition. Farewell, mediocrity. Then she saw Agatha charge through the flames. Agatha, no, Sophie cried. Agatha leapt on top of her, and both were dragged into the darkness. Instantly, the fires around the villagers were extinguished. They dashed for the woods, but the trees magically grew thick and thorny, locking them out. It was too late. What are you doing? Sophie roared, shoving and scratching Agatha as the shadow pulled them into pitch-black forest. Agatha thrashed wildly, trying to wrest the shadow's grip on Sophie and Sophie's grip on the shadow. You're ruining everything, Sophie howled. Agatha bit her hand. Aye, Sophie brayed and flipped her body so Agatha scraped against dirt. Agatha flipped Sophie back and climbed towards the shadow, her clump squashing Sophie's face. When my hands find your neck... They felt themselves leave the ground, as something spindly and cold wrapped its way around them. Agatha fumbled for a match from her dress, struck it against her bony wrist, and paled. The shadow was gone. They were cocooned in the creepers of an elm, which ferried them up the enormous tree and plopped them on the lowest branch. Both girls glared at each other and tried to catch enough breath to speak. Agatha managed it first. We are going home, right now. The branch wobbled, coiled back like a sling, and shot them up like bullets. Before either could scream, they landed on another branch. Agatha flailed for a new match, but the branch coiled and snapped them up to the next bough, which bounced them up to the next. How tall is this tree? Agatha shrieked, ping-ponging up branches. The girls' bodies collided and crashed, dresses tearing on thorns and twigs, faces slamming into ricocheting limbs, until finally they reached the highest bough. There at the top of the elm tree sat a giant black egg. The girls gaped at it, baffled. The egg tore open, splashing them with dark, yolky goo as a colossal bird emerged, made only of bones. 
It took one look at the pair and unleashed an angry screech that rattled their eardrums. Then it grabbed them both in its claws and dove off the tree as they screamed, finally agreeing on something. The bony bird lashed through the black woods as Agatha frantically lit match after match on the bird's ribs, giving them catches of glinting red eyes and bristling shadows. All around, gangly trees snatched at the girls as the bird dipped and climbed to avoid them, until thunder exploded ahead and they smashed headfirst into a raging lightning storm. Firebolts sent trees careening towards them and they shielded their faces from rain, mud and timber, ducked cobwebs, beehives and vipers, until the bird plunged into deadly briars and the girls blanched, closing their eyes to the pain. Then it was quiet. Agatha? Agatha opened her eyes to rays of sun. She looked down and gasped. It's real. Far beneath them, two soaring castles sprawled across the forest. One castle glittered in sun mist with pink and blue glass turrets over a sparkling lake. The other loomed, blackened and jagged, sharp spires ripping through thunderclouds like the teeth of a monster. The school for good and evil. The bony bird drifted over the towers of good and loosened Sophie from its claws. Agatha clutched her friend in horror, but then saw Sophie's face, glowing with happiness. Aggie, I'm a princess. But the bird dropped Agatha instead. Stunned, Sophie watched Agatha plummet into pink cotton candy mist. Wait, no! The bird swooped savagely towards the towers of evil, its jaws reaching up for new prey. No, I'm good! It's the wrong one! Sophie screamed. And without a beat, she was dropped into hellish darkness. In the heat of the moment, you're not just keeping it calm, you're keeping it cool too. With an ice cold cold brew, and not just any cold brew, but one that's slow steeped and mixed with brown sugar and molasses flavor. With a cold foam infused with brown sugar coolness and a cinnamon sugar sprinkle on top. That's keeping it calm, cool, and cold brewed. With Dunkin's new brown sugar cream cold brew, America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Terms apply. Finding the right person for the job isn't easy. Just ask someone who hired a stuntman to do their home renovations. Just finished the new sunroom, Mrs. C. The best part is I used candy glass for all the windows, so you can do this. And this. Doesn't hurt a bit either. But if you've got an insurance question, you can always count on your local GEICO agent. They can bundle your policies, which could save you hundreds. And if you don't want to take the long way to the kitchen, the walls are breakaway too. See? For expert help with all your insurance needs, visit geico.com slash local today.